group. I just want to welcome everybody to today's Zoe and thank all the participants in advance and all the people who are joining us virtually from right around the country. Uh, today's kōrero, we will start with Tim Jones from Christchurch Art Gallery, then we'll hear from Victoria Passau and Daniel, oops, incorrectly spelt, Miller, spent, uh, uh, spelt. Uh, at Auckland Museum and Tara Fagan and Adrian Kingston at Te Papa and I'll chip in along the way. So I will stop screen sharing so that we can see the speakers and I just ask that those who are not speaking please make sure you are muted because otherwise you turn up on the, um, on the screen for the recording. So as I say, anybody who is not speaking, could they please mute themselves now? Um, so, kia ora tato. I'm going to uh, go straight through to introducing today's uh, ZUI, Digital Opportunities. This is part of a series which Museum Saotearoa has been working on with National Services Te Paerangi and a lot of other contributor, contributors trying to pick up on some of the, the concerns, the opportunities, the issues that, that are arising in our pandemic context. Uh, I just want to acknowledge particularly today, Virginia Gao, who is National Digital Forum Coordinator and also has been working with Museums Aotearoa on our new website, which will go live next month. Uh, who was very instrumental in helping us to think about what we might talk about today. So thank you, Virginia, even though she declined to speak herself. Uh, so we're going to talk about some of the opportunities under a few broad headings of, of how we've uh, taken some, some new steps towards uh, working around play, collaboration, education, and also new ways of working. And our first speaker is Tim Jones from Christchurch Art Gallery, Te Puna o Waifetu. Tim, over to you. I hope you're there. You were there. Um, okay, are we having trouble finding Tim? He was definitely there. There is not Tim. Um, okay, so we've got a bit of trouble finding Tim. So in that case, um, perhaps we will just wait while we find out what's happening with Tim. And if it's all right with the Auckland Museum team, I'm going to hand over to you, Victoria. Um. Should be fine. Oops. Um, oh, I shouldn't be looking up. I'm supposed to be looking straight ahead. Um, my name is uh, Victoria Passau and I am Online Cenotaph Collection Manager at Auckland Museum. And so Dan and I will talk to you about um, collaboration in lockdown. Phil, welcome. <laughs> You're interrupting the Zoe. Um, so Dan can start speaking to, about uh, the transcription project with the visitor host. Take it away, Dan. Uh, kia ora everyone, um, this is Dan Miller, so I'm part of uh, Victoria's team on the online cenotaph at Auckland Museum. So today um, I'll just be talking about our transcription project that we uh, ran with the visitor hosts from the museum over, over the lockdown period. Um, yeah, and it's been really successful. And then we'll, Victoria will talk about some other projects that we've had going uh, over lockdown as well. Um, so basically I work remotely from Wellington. Um, since January January this year, so kind of the original uh, remote worker. Um, and I came down to Wellington basically to look at the archives here and um, go to the original documents, uh, listings of service personnel to fill some gaps uh, in the online cenotaph database. So by the time uh, lockdown came, um, we had all these, tran uh, these transcriptions um, that I'd photographed, probably about a thousand pages from Archive New Zealand mainly. And when lockdown came, we were in a really good position to be able to carry on with a lot of this um, this project work that's, that's beneficial for us. So um, 
we realised that a lot of the other workers in the museum um, weren't able to do their jobs. Um, so using basically Google Drive and uh, me managing things remotely, we were able to get them to start uh, transcribing these lists of um, service personnel. So what they were transcribing was um, records that we didn't have on the database already. So mainly Korean War uh, normal roles, which is about five to 6,000 um, personnel, individuals, um, service women from the Women's Auxiliary Air Force and the Women's Auxiliary Army Corps, um, also Air Force, Navy, uh, records from Malaya, Borneo, and things like that. So things that were hard to get because we didn't have access to those um, Defence Force records, they hadn't been digitised, so we basically um, went straight to the source and did that. So over the, I think it ended up being about an eight week project and they um, transcribed about 700, uh, 770 pages of data, um, 17 workers that were taken off the floor. So they used to work in the, on the desk and on the floor in the museum. Um, and it's about 100, 170,000 words and about, it represents about 14,000 individuals. So quite a massive project and we were able to to get that um get that successfully completed over the time and they were really good they were enthusiastic they learnt the ropes really fast and um some of them did a, a, a absolutely amazing job so some of them got through um uh, one to two thousand pages over that time um yeah and it's just a great example of collaboration basically um the the visitor host got something out of it they looked to looked at these historical documents and learned how to how to read them um, a lot of the abbreviations and military language and they learned some history as well which is important for our war memorial function at the museum so um, the collaboration was really inspiring they're really um, adaptable great attitudes um, so basically it was really good to turn a time of crisis into a time of opportunity and, and a huge gain for us something that would have taken years to complete um, we got done over eight weeks so um, it was really cool to see. Um, so now I'll just quickly pass over to Victoria and then we'll have some time for questions at the end, I think. Kia ora. Um, so in parallel, in a parallel project, we also managed to provide a transcription project to our volunteers. So we have around 200 volunteers at the museum and about 25 that do um, information desk work. And so when we were in lockdown, we're in the position with Roz, our um, volunteer manager. She was trying to find um, work for them to do during that time. And we used a, a similar um, process where we would put content onto um, our Google Drive, but we also utilized our um, uh, application called Zooniverse to upload about 3,000 images of um, grave sites that we had not been able to transcribe before. So they're sort of grave panels of people's names and service numbers. And we put those up and I think it was done by five or, or ten volunteers in about a week. So it sort of showed to us that there are people out there who are really wanting to contribute and want to remain connected to Auckland Museum during the lockdown. And I think there was a, there was an element where people were feeling that sort of need to sort of just sort of get away from the stresses of the pandemic. And so it just was sort of like a slightly mindless task for them to undertake where they felt like they were doing some good work. Um, our team's quite small, so we've got three staff members. And so there's content that, and I have to be honest, that, co that content had been waiting for 10 years to be um, transcribed. And we hadn't really been able, or hadn't really thought about utilizing our volunteers before, just because um, they're al they were always busy doing front of house work, which has sort of the whole, sh the museum has really shifted in, in its service, especially during that three months. And so it just meant that people felt like they were doing something of use. And I think Roz really appreciated that work but you don't necessarily need to use Zooniverse, although it is a really good resource um, to make these projects. Google Docs works as well if you've got a, a myriad of different types of formats and people just can log in. And, and I think it's also taught some of our um, volunteers that they can use the technology. And, and, and I think that that will be an ongoing thing. Um, and this year we've even have a digital volunteer who lives in um, in Sydney and a couple of our volunteers have chosen to continue to work from home to focus on transcription. So I think it is sort of shifting the way that the museum does um, volunteer work. 
and um, and we're really pleased that we've been able to provide that during the, the lockdown. Thank you, Victoria and Dan. Um, that's that's a really interesting part about the, the volunteers and, and engaging people to do things that might not have otherwise been on their horizon or even planned as part of the priorities of uh, for the Auckland Museum team. Um, and I think this is what we've been seeing is, is quite a lot of completely new things happening that hadn't been planned before and some really fast moves to, uh, to make those things happen. Now, unfortunately, Tim Jones at Christchurch Art Gallery has not been able to connect, um, something to do with their permissions down there. So we'll have to do without him today and maybe we'll get him back another time. So I'm gonna to go to Tara and Tara Fagan is in the education team at Te Papa and one of the leaders of the Rauranga Matahiko uh, program. And they have also done a huge pivot uh, in terms of what they've been providing and how they've been providing their program. So Tara, over to you. I'll unmute you, there you go. Uh, no, it's not letting me unmute you, I'm sorry. Okay, there we go. Kia ora tātou, uh, ko Tara Fagan uh, taku ingoa. I am Tara Fagan, as Philip has said, thanks for the introduction. Um, we've had a really uh, interesting time over lockdown in terms of, so I'm, I'm here at Te Papa as part of our learning team, but equally part of the Rauranga Matihiko Fano, which is a project led by Te Papa, funded by the Ministry of Education and run from Te Papa, MTG Hawke's Bay, Waitangi Museum and Waikato Museum. So through that, we're obviously, whatever, whether we're in the learning team or um, working in Rauranga Matihiko, we're working directly with students and teachers who generally come into the museum. So we had to plan and, um, and work with teachers and students in a very different way very quickly. For our Rauranga Matihiko whānau, we were set up and connected online because we collaborate regularly across our four sites. Um, so we were doing things like um, during lockdown, school was still going at home. For those of you with kids, you will know you probably had to sit there and help support their home learning uh, to a lot of degrees. But um, it was being able to support teachers who were still coming to grips with what it means to teach online. A lot of our teachers are used to face-to-face -face delivery, so they had to make a very quick transition using their two weeks holiday to get themselves up online. So we put a lot of support into helping them do that. And then when they were teaching their classes online, we would do things like we would zoom in or use whatever technology to come in and work with the teacher in the class during that time around a concept. So it might have been around to tile or it might have been around art um, and do short classes with the teacher and their students. Um, other things that we did was uh, run webinars, which proved successful. I think our largest had over 200 and probably our smallest was about 10 or 11 during that time. So we could provide support for teachers right around the country while keeping our museum kaupapa um, strong in what we did. So we might teach about things like digital technologies or coding, for example, but it was all linked back to what we do in the museum. Um, so that remained strong in our process. So we do things like um, yeah, teacher webinars, webinars for learners. Um, some of our team created Google websites based around a particular exhibition item that we had in either Te Papa or one of our uh, museums. So you could go in and explore that item in depth and then learners would be guided through a set of questions where they could answer and all the um, their responses came through to a human who would respond back to the students. So it wasn't a right or a wrong, it was maybe create a project about the story about Coupe and the giant Vicky, for example, and students were taken through that story, had different ways they could respond and then they'd submit their work to us. So lots of different ways in which we got up and running to provide support for our teachers and for our students. Um, one of the other things we did was uh, just design some resources for teachers so they could understand how they could use a museum in new ways for learning programs. So rather than the once a year visits, which a lot of us tend to have in museums, uh, we talk to them specifically about 
um, how they could make use and integrate a concept such as kaitiakitanga right through their curriculum. So there was literacy, numeracy, science, etc., all coming off that, and they were really popular too. Um, we found schools engaged really well. There was an immediate need for our teachers to be able to engage in this way and to provide support for their learners, which was great. Um, it, we had its challenges in that a lot of our lower decile schools, um, students didn't have access to online learning. And for those students, I still feel really sad and disheartened for them because they are always, um, they're always going to be at a disadvantage when it comes to being able to learn and support online if they don't have access to devices or to Wi-Fi. The Ministry of Education is working on resolving that, but it didn't happen during lockdown. So when we were working with classes, it generally tended to be those higher decile students anyway that are used to museums and how we work. Um, but we hope in time that we can continue supporting and particularly when modems go out to homes of low decile students, then we'll be able to access them. For now, students are back in, in schools and learning in that way, but there's still a bit of online learning for some of our students. Um, what I feel disappointed about is that this was a real time of opportunity in education. We need to make some shifts in our education system about teaching and learning. And while it's great that we've come back and we're down at level one so quickly, it's not enough time to embed some of those changes that we needed to about different ways of working to ensure, or to ensure the support of learning for everyone. So you've got your mainstream students that learn well in the school setting, but there's those that fall outside of that, or those students who uh, sit, for example, a lot of the year and spend a lot of time learning from home. How can we keep this, this duality or the openness of, of blended learning online, or blended learning, I guess, a mixture of face-to-face -face and online for all our students? Um, along with um, what we did in terms of education, our Tipu Tiaki Manatonga, which is the old MEANS, the Museum Education Network, um, we provided, so I'm one of the co-chairs of uh, Tipu Tiaki Manatonga, and we, we started webinars right from the start of lockdown to support our educators that are around the region, and it's lovely to see Rich and Nikki online, they attended quite a few of our webinars to support. And what we tried to do with that was talk about the needs of educators in, in our profession um, and how we could make so, or continue support uh, for our students and our teachers and look for opportunities where we could collaborate and work together. So we had some very broad discussions on um, topics about what lockdown meant, how we could continue to keep our contracts going with the Ministry of Education that funds so many of our jobs. But some of them were very hands-on, like how can we use Google Sites or Google Docs or Zoom to be able to engage with our students. So um, they were equally popular too. And it was a really good opportunity um, to engage with people from around the country during that time. If there was something I got out of um, working in this way of that time, it was that we were able to reach nationally, not just across our four Rauranga Matahiko sites that I talk to regularly, but we could get a really good perspective of what's happening around the country and learn from each other as well. So that's just a very quick overview from me about learning uh, during this time. And I'll hand over to Adrian now. Or Cara, Cara. Cara, you're going to someone else first. What's that, sorry? You're going to go to someone else before me. Um, I was just going to do a little bit of, of follow-up with what Tara was saying. Um, you've raised some really important things about the actual ways of working and, and the capacity. And I think probably we've all learned quite a lot in different ways about, uh, about both the, the opportunities and the limitations of working in the digital world. Uh, certainly from the Museum's Aotearoa point of view, we had a new staff member, um, Sarah Robinson, our new permanent admin and membership manager, come on just the week before lockdown. So, you know, she had two days in the office and then was sent home with a laptop. <laughs> and luckily, we were in a position of, of having all our official files online and uh, luckily she and I were able to set up at home successfully and we also had Lynn Carmichael working with us at that point. But um, it was still quite challenging to be able to actually develop those new ways of working right from scratch when you're not actually being face to face. So I think um, that's probably something which needs a little bit more exploring by all of us as we as we perhaps rely more heavily 
on digital working methods. Um, I personally also noticed that uh, with all these Zoom meetings, which we've kind of mostly got used to, it is actually quite challenging to, to run a work meeting um, if you don't have a kind of an acceptance of, of chairing and taking turns and the protocols of running a meeting. And perhaps some of us um, learned a bit about that and perhaps some of us learn, need to learn a little bit more about it as well. There are certainly disadvantages as well as advantages in being able to, to connect virtually. Um, the other point about the working arrangements which I wanted to make was actually uh, is this going to make permanent changes for us? And for some of us, I think it probably is. There's been quite a lot of talk about how many people would still like to be working from home at least part of the time. And I think that that's a really good option to perhaps rethink that work-life balance in terms of how much time you spend commuting, uh, whether you do need to be on site or off site uh, for all the time. But then it also brings into, into question some of the capacity issues of very many of our museums and galleries around the country of actually not having, like the schools you were talking about, Tara, not having the connectivity, not having the, the tech uh, in place already, and not having the resources to do that. So that's a challenge which we hope will be addressed uh, as we go ahead in this new world we're coming into. That's probably all I need to say about the work at the moment. Um, just to note that we will be adding, uh, asking questions using the chat. So do just add your questions in as we go. And uh, we've already got some useful links in there as well. So um, Adrian, perhaps you'd like to talk about some of the other things that. Sure. So obviously um, for Te Papa, physical visitation is uh, one of our major milestones. Um, so dropping from 1.3 million visitors to a year to potentially you know, zero, um, depending on how long things we're going to go for, we had to do a really massive um, refocus, just like everybody else did, into digital, but also to making sure that um, the audiences understood that we were still around and we could still offer some services. Um, but we also didn't want to do it just for the sake of protecting our brand or for keeping our numbers high. So we thought pretty quickly and pretty carefully about what it was that people would actually want. Um, we'll all remember it was a pretty stressful time and there was a lot of uncertainty. Um, we were really lucky in that whilst I always feel like we're under-resourced and that kind of thing, I know we're in an incredibly lucky position. And we were able to draw on um, five to ten years worth of content that we'd been developing um, on an ongoing basis and really push it to the fore. So we did a homepage takeover um, where we got rid of all of the exhibitions and all of that kind of thing and we, and we um, pushed our existing digital resources. We also made something called the Little Page of Calm, um, which on that it had a whole lot of nice, calming, relaxing types of resources. Um, we had some atmospheric videos, we had some mindfulness, um, slow art experiences that we'd been experimenting with that people could do on their screens. Um, we pulled out all of the quizzes that we've done in the last two or three years, um, which are still learning opportunities as well, but it's also the kind of thing that people were missing. Um, and we also got really lucky with the fact that we'd been experimenting with an online jigsaw um, open tool uh, in the weeks leading up to. We didn't have the understanding that we were going to be locking down and, and actually needing something along these lines, but um, we were lucky we were able to react really quickly. So we, we wanted to make sure that we were doing what the audience really needed. So just trying to think what else we had on there. Um, we also pulled in just some, some slightly quirkier stuff. So it can be pretty daunting for new audiences to go into something like our collections online, where we've got a million objects, 500,000 images, and, and lots of other content. So what we did instead was we made some subsections on the website that just pulled through some of the coolest, funniest, nicest images of animals, of New Zealand landscapes, of teaspoons, of shoes, just to give people a bit of a taste and something different from, from what they might have been used to looking at um, on, with Te Papa. 
Um, with the learning team, we've also been developing um, activity books over the last three years as well. Um, on the digital divide, one of the things that is a problem with the activity books is it requires people to have a printer at home. Um, and, we, and we specifically avoided things like um, print out your own colouring and stuff based on our collections because, again, we knew people didn't have uh, a lot of printers at home. We know that people print things at work and then take them home, but that wasn't possible. Um, but the activity books were still actually incredibly um, active. So we've got um, Tokelau language activity books, Te Reo Māori, Matariki activity books, Colossal Squid activity books, and these are all just download them as PDF and, and they've got quizzes and, and things to learn and all that kind of thing. They were downloaded 16,000 times over lockdown. Um, Matariki, Maramataka and Te Reo were the most popular and they were downloaded two to 3,000 times each. Um, and that's actually, it's a real sign of um, meaningful engagement because actually downloading something along those lines, we know that it was parents looking for things for their kids to do and stuff like that. So again, we were able to, we didn't have to make this stuff new. We were really lucky that we'd been in investing in this kind of content for the last few years. We also offer um, high resolution image download, downloads through our collections online and um, we weren't really sure what the increased traffic was going to be to things like this, but we had 7,000 images downloaded over lockdown, which is up 50% on what we would normally have. And the kinds of comments that we get were people um, making new things, just looking for inspiration, also printing out things like photos of Big Ted so that they could stick them in their windows for the, the great teddy bear hunt, um, people downloading Anzac poppies for, for, for Anzac Day, um, so again, we were just lucky that through the work that we've actually been doing in the last 10 or 15 years, particularly digitization, um, we managed to get new audiences and uh, more activity from our existing audiences. The learning team also designed um, new Farnell challenges, um, which were things that were specifically designed as activities that you didn't have to have anything other than what you had lying around home. Um, so that was really important to make sure, and that's why, so these, these activities were slightly different than, um, than the other activity books because they, they really were in the context of, of people not being able to leave their houses to get materials. Um, so there were things like create a rainbow with things at home. So find objects around the house, create a rainbow on your table or whatever, and take a photo and submit that through social media or Facebook or whatever. Um, draw an image of your favourite bird from the collections. Just really simple things like that, and they were really popular. And what we, what I didn't think, but the learning team probably knew. So we designed these for kids and families at home, but they've been used by teachers a lot as well. Teachers who were looking for existing resources that they could use for distance learning too. Um, people have been getting pretty sick of hearing about our jigsaws, and one of the measures of success was, um, there was actually a tweet that said, if someone tells me about the Papa jigsaw one more time, I'm gonna scream. Um, and we, we counted that as a measure of success. Basically, we've had 125,000 unique um, views or, or activity on, on the jigsaws that we've made. It peaked at 12,000 in one day, which is, is bigger than basically anything we've had other than the Colossal Squid. Um, and we know that they're doing them because they're spending eight minutes on the page. We can see from the analytics. So, um, but also we got huge, huge feedback. Um, there's, there's a few like, I'm going to do a couple of your online jigsaw puzzles. They help me unwind after work along with a large GNT. Please, please keep adding to the collection. Um, another thing that I was surprised about was, and I probably shouldn't have been, is the amount of people, teachers who were using them for teaching as well. Um, we kind of planned them for adults and, and young people, but uh, we had one teacher say that they were using them to help teach mathematics because you can choose the number of tiles that you have and I think that's what they were using. It's like picture how many how many pieces this is going to break into. Um, there was a lot of people commenting around the fact that it was, they actually appreciated the fact that it helped them relax and it distracted them. So challenge my puzzling, puzzling skills and relaxing. Another one called helping me recover from an accident. Um, things like from a local library in Washington State, USA to see your puzzle. So the thing is, of course, it wasn't just New Zealand that was in lockdown, it was actually much of the world that was heading into it. And so we saw a big spike in international traffic as well. And um, towards the end, there was, uh, so I'm doing jigsaw puzzles, just heard about them on ABC Sydney Radio. Um, and then, yeah, they, they were mentioned all over the place, including from, um, well, the little page of Calm was 
was referenced by um, ICOM in one of their newsletters as a really good example of thinking about mental well-being of our audiences and not just staying with the numbers. Uh, right after I saw the CBS Sunday is going to have a piece on people doing more puzzles during stay at home, someone shared these beautiful di digital jigsaw puzzles from Te Papa in New Zealand. But also we were really careful about the images that from the collection that we chose to make sure that they were a way of engaging with culture and the collection. Um, and so there were a few good ex um, comments that we got back. So these are cool and a nice way of appreciating the art that you have. So we were making sure that it was more than just a shallow, shallow engagement. What we actually had in the end was um, obviously, so one of the things we do at Tapapa is we segment our digital visitors into motivation. So one thing is who's coming to our websites to plan a visit, who's coming to our websites to book a venue or look at shops or that kind of thing, who's coming to Tapapa's websites to get sector help, or who's coming to Tapapa to use our digital museum resources because they want to learn something or research something and that sort of thing. Obviously the people who are planning a visit no one was planning a visit during lockdown. So that, that segment drops 90%. But the digital museum visitation went up by 50%, which far outstripped any of the, um, the losses that we had in other places. So normally digital museum sits around just under 200,000 visits um, a month. It was 320,000 in April. Um, so what was really important to us was those are new audiences and we and because some of the comments are saying I would never have thought to look at Papa for this kind of content. So we need to make sure that we we think about those new audiences and how we're going to maintain a relationship with them. Um, another, just talking about digital divide, one of the things that I looked at just recently was the type of device that was used um, when people were accessing our content. What's interesting is on collections online, the the breakdown between desktop, mobile, and tablet didn't change much. So there's something in there about the type of visitor um, and the technology that they have and maybe the understanding of museology that they have. Whereas the increase, the, the change on the, um, some of the digital museum stuff we had on the main website, as you would expect, desktop dropped significantly and mobile and tablet increased. People don't have desktops and laptops at home so much um, because they use them at work. So obviously we need to be aware of the types of technologies that people are using at home um, and design more for them. And this is not new, but it's a really interesting concrete example of when we're forced into something, um, what we can learn about the differences between accessing content at work or school versus home. I think I'll leave that there. Thank you, Adrian. That's, that's a huge amount you've shared with us. And, and the increase in a new audience is a really interesting one. Um, one of the uh, questions is, about how this is going to look after we've finished all the lockdown and people are getting out and coming to, uh, to our museums and galleries in person again, uh, how much of the online work is going to continue and how much do we think audiences are going to be wanting to continue to engage with us online? Um, perhaps, Adrian, you might have some thoughts on that? I think there's a lot of unknowns. I think you I've been surprised through every milestone of COVID about what's happened. Um, and there's been a lot of talk about what the post-COVID world looks like. But I've also seen in New Zealand particularly, a lot of us returning to our old ways um, in ways that have surprised me quite a lot. Um, but I do think that, so the onus is, I, I, I think we, Tara and I were just talking before, one thing that COVID has done, it's probably been talked about on, on these hobby before is, Digital literacy has improved slightly. So the amount of people who haven't ever done a, a Zoom or a video call before and have been forced into it, now it feels normal. Um, so my father understands them now and he, he would never have thought about it before. And he does it from his phone um, and he's, he's 80. So I think there's, there's going to be a lot of um, exposure to new things that hopefully will maintain from an audience perspective, but we need to actually learn what happened as well. Um, so we need to think about what happened, um, what was successful. I've done some, some surface level analysis of what worked and what didn't and where we can carry some of these things on. The thing that's actually been most useful for me is um, we do a lot of um, gathering of content through pop-up surveys and things like that to get real stories. And those are the things that allow me and this organisation to show the, the real um, 
value of, of what it is that we offer digitally because we do tend to, being perfectly honest, and I'm sure that most people won't be surprised about this, we do tend to focus on the, the main Wellington building a lot. It's where the majority of our funding goes and all, what most of our staff are working on. But this has been really useful for saying, no, we need to actually be thinking about digital a lot more. And we've been on a journey of that, and the only reason we were able to respond so well was because we have been slowly building up content over the last five to 10 years. But uh, there's a real world in the organization post COVID that we need to invest more in digital and we need to understand our digital audiences more. Um, so what that actually means, I think it's a bit too early to tell, but, um, Definitely we're going to try, um, but possibly also not just seeing digital as a standalone thing, mm -hmm. making it more part of a hybrid experience um, and tying it to things like our public program and our learning and, uh, and what happens on the floor, but also not, making, not leaving it to be an afterthought, which is sometimes what happens with digital. Thank you. That's, that's really important. And it, it kind of gets me on to the next point, which is how are we going to change what we're doing uh, in future? And we talked a little bit on a previous ZUI about public programming and how that has changed just in the immediate um, circumstances of having to uh, accommodate physical distancing and those other kind of precautions, but also how to, to make... Um, new use of some of the, the innovations that have happened during this time. And if we do that, what do we stop doing? How do we, how do we manage the resourcing of this? Um, and I think that's a bit of a challenge. And certainly, uh, Dan and Victoria, you've, you've made the use of, of some kind of resource which was not otherwise able to be used during lockdown, but are you going to be able to continue to do that? Are you, for instance, going to have the Auckland Museum volunteers continue to do other work apart from on-site work? Uh, yeah, I think, um... I'm still working down in Wellington. I'm still producing these documents uh, from Wellington and using uh, Google Drive. So um, the number of volunteers we have um, available will probably go down. Um, but we hope to, to the, some of this work will continue and is continuing right now. So um, I think it'll it'll be a um, for the next few years an ongoing ongoing thing. Victoria. I concur, Dan. I think that it will, and I think the engagement from our volunteers feeling like they may not want to be, oh, sorry, sorry, may not want to come in to the museum or may want to contribute if they've moved to the Gold Coast or they've moved somewhere else. I think that's a really good opportunity. Um, and it also means that um, we can do things without having to pay for transcription, which is a massive um, expense for us and we can focus on doing things more in a more fiscally responsible way. Yes, you're, and you're not the only museum that's made the use of this time to, to do transcription. And um, I think it was the Air Force Museum were able to add a whole lot of metadata to, to imagery um, during the lockdown. And so catching up on some projects which have actually added to the digital assets that, that now can be brought into play uh, in different ways. Um, a very quick question to Adrian. Uh, the tool that you use to create the puzzles, would you be able to share that? Is that a freely available one? And if so, could you add it into the chat for us so that other people could potentially use it? And if it's not able, not a freely available one, then um, perhaps you could let us know what the situation is with using it. Um, uh, it, it, it is freely available. Um, and we did help a couple of other museums around the world set these up as well. Um, but I'll, I'll send it through. Thank you very much. Um, which kind of brings us back to that collaboration in a, in a more of a sector-based way. One of the things which I've certainly noticed during this time is how willing colleagues have been to just pick up the phone, get on Zoom, answer questions, help each other, which has been great. I'd really, really love to, to see that continue. Um, I wonder if uh, any of our speakers today uh, would like to talk about how you might see the 
individual sharing of some of these resources and ideas going forward. Um, Tara, perhaps you might answer this one because you've been very active in that with the um, Te Putiaki Manataonga group. Um, yeah, I hope we can continue the sharing and the collaboration. Obviously, um, people are back in their workplace now, so the ability time-wise to connect um, isn't, isn't there as much as it was. And I think um, during the hype, we were running webinars every week for Te Putiaki Manitoba, just as a connection for people, um, but also skill sharing. And so that time, we've now dropped to fortnightly, and they'll go back to monthly very shortly. Um, but for me, it's a great way to be able to connect across the nation because we've all got something to share. So it's finding ways in which we can continue to keep those going as well as our day-to-day -day working connections so that we don't come back into our silos, but we're looking more at the, at the whole, I guess, the whole country and how we can support each other. That's been keen. Uh, key. The other thing that we've done, um, particularly for Te Putiaki Manatonga, is making use of digital tools for asynchronous communication so that when we've got time, we can go in and share. So we've got um, a Facebook page for those that, that Facebook, but we've also set up an online community using Tribe for Te Putiaki Manatonga. So it's a private online community where you can share you know, thoughts, people can respond. And so we're starting to see those gain in momentum as people return home from work in the evenings and just log on to say, I'm trying to do this with my students, they're not back, how can, how can we engage with them? And somebody in our community will always have an answer. So that's um, something that we're doing. Um, and I think the, the most important thing, where we can, we're making everything freely available. We're licensing under Creative Commons um, and making sure that those resources, whether they're for schools or for the museum sector, are freely available. We don't want to keep them sort of controlled by a set sort of group. I don't know whether that quite answers your question, Philippa, but that's, that's our thinking of where to next. That, that sounds pretty good to me. Um, one of the questions which has arisen in, in a slightly different context for me is if we're going to do more as museums and galleries online, uh, we're not going to have people coming in and putting the resources in, like spending money in our shops and our, in our uh, cafes on, on site. Is there a way that we can monetize any of this digital work? Uh, and is that something we should be looking at? Um, Adrian, have you had some thoughts about that one? You were nodding. <laughs> <laughs> it's obviously something that we talk about at Papa a lot because um, we fifty percent of our funding does come from our commercial activities. So that means uh, retail, it means parking, it means, but more importantly, it also means our venues and events. And of course, we lost all of those during lockdown, and um, we're losing any of the international ones for the foreseeable future. And people are still a little bit worried about um, big group gatherings and things like that. So we know it's going to take a, quite a long time. And plus, people don't have the money that they did before. Um, Organisations are being much more prudent where they spend their money, so they're less likely to be paying for a, a large conference here. So we have been looking at how we diversify our funding. Um, a, a big driver for me, though, is that needs to be done in balance of our core mission and values. And we wouldn't have... Um, had, we wouldn't have had the impact and the, and the reach that we did over COVID if we were charging for image downloads, if we were charging for the activity books and things like that. So I think it's got to be something that's managed really carefully. Um, it's an old argument and it's and it, of course it's going to come back is why, why don't we charge for these kinds of things when once we start hitting um, fiscal risk areas. But I think we need to be creative about how we look for new revenue avenues um, and rather than falling back on old ways which actually end up hurting our audiences. I think there's something that we can look at in terms of, we know that with what we're doing with uh, the various digital outreach we have, we, we're actually offering value. Um, and so we could say, look, to help do more of this, maybe make a little donation rather than putting a barrier in the way. And if we did micro donations of a dollar a download and, and you know, entirely optional, then maybe we would see a bit more money coming in to help cover. I don't think it would be much, much money at all, but maybe it adds up to something. Um, but I, I would be reluctant to put too, too much of a financial barrier in the way of, of us providing access to, our, to the national collections and, and the impact that we want to have, particularly when we know there are other barriers such as digital literacy um, and data and all of those kinds of things as well. 
Yes, thank you. It's a very good point that, that not putting a barrier in the way. You want to make the, um, the basic free for everyone experience available before you actually put charges on. I wonder if there is um, a way of converting some of the other paid for uh, things that people would normally expect to pay for in person to convert those into digital uh, opportunities whether it's um, framing them in the way of a retail experience, for instance. So uh, perhaps um, some of the things which, which might have otherwise be seen as a, as a physical um, acquisition. Um, Victoria, has Auckland Museum given any thought to this aspect of the digital programming? In terms of monetizing? Yes. For, I think for us, because we've created um, the content for, you know, the images and the data for people to access. I mean, I was just talking to Adam and it's sort of about that value add aspect of if we're going to publish a book or it's going to be in, el in electronic form or in our bookshop, then that is where the cost would come in. Um, I think, I mean, for a military uh, database, which was about commemoration, I think it would be completely inappropriate place for that for the content to become a paid thing but there would be other um, aspects where um, the museum could definitely um, connect with other organizations to create something out of our out of our content um, for for to monetize our collections but it would have to be also a culturally appropriate as well mm. so the kind of virtual reality type um experience for instance so instead of a an on-site guided tour there might be something which someone from the other side of the world might be able to experience in a, in a digital form absolutely and i mean it could be a um you know a, an education package that people can can learn about i don't know the new zealand wars or you know you'd have to think about what it is i'm just only making things up now um but that could be a thing where they don't have to physically come in because I, I mean it's similar with what adrian was talking about is that we do tend to focus on the building and people coming physically into the space and there are many options for us to be able to expand our business practice to enable um, people from all around the world because we know that so many people engage from, with our content from around the world who would who are prepared to and work and live in different places that expect to pay for services online so um, yeah there is definitely room for us to all grow in that area Excellent. Now we are heading towards the end of our hour. Um, there have been a couple of questions about um, the education work and I'll probably put that onto um, the, uh, the educators network and Te Putiaki Mana Taonga uh, and suggest that people engage with the education side of things specifically through that group, through the Facebook group. The uh, link was shared in the chat on this uh, Zoe, and we will make sure that that link is, is findable on the MA website as well. There's also been uh, a query about uh, capacity building for smaller organisations, and that's certainly something uh, which we were talking to the Ministry for Culture and Heritage about in terms of the their new capability funding, and maybe there might be some opportunities to, to beef up the digital capacity across the sector uh, through that in the future. Um, so before we finish up, just looking a bit further ahead and how we might grow some of this new awareness, digital capacity amongst our audiences and amongst ourselves as a sector. Um, Adrian, would you like to just have a little corridor about where the National Digital Forum is heading and uh, your thoughts on this year's event and uh, the new strategy that you're working on? Sure. So um, COVID comes at interesting times for all, all kinds of work streams. Uh, we were actually looking at uh, changing or revising the strategy for the National Digital Forum We've been working on it for the last six months. It feels like we've been working on it for the last 10 years, but we've been working on it um, a bit more solidly in the last six months and really trying to understand where we fit in the uh, ecosystem of New Zealand glams um, and government and things like that. And so we were coming up with a new strategy 
And one of the things we were thinking about there was the one of the most successful things that we do, obviously, is the conference. And it's, it's really successful. People love it. Um, it's our biggest uh, cost, but it's also our biggest... Um, well, we, we usually make a small profit off it. Um, last year, we actually lost money, but that's okay. Um, but it is a big part of what we do, and a lot of people only know us for that as well. So what we were thinking about doing was maybe just rethinking how we manage that conference, um, maybe as a more iterative thing over the year, um, maybe trying different formats such as maybe a one-day in-person thing and, and smaller ones in other places every three months or something along those lines, really trying to think about how we can spread across the country a bit more. Um, and and not spread ourselves so thin. The NDF board is all volunteers, um, and it can be really difficult to do anything too big. Um, so committing, we, we found that we've overcommitted ourselves in the past and not been able to, to deliver. So we were really thinking about how do we fit in relation to the other um, Glam Peak organisations such as EMA and, and National Services and, and Leanza and the others, and how can we actually maybe be focus on what is specific to our strengths, which is that um, we are cross-sectoral and we have um, our focus digi is digital and of course then, but it's not, it's actually about humans uh, and where digital thinking fits in. Digital thinking has been a big driver for us rather than digital technology. Um, and so focusing on that and how we can work with uh, the, the wider sector on that as a, as a future looking forward thing. Then COVID happened. Um, and, and we, we just started doing um, planning for the, the conference and because we only have a certain amount of cash in reserve, we decided, and because we didn't know what was going to happen and because we rely so heavily um, on international keynotes as well, we had to make a call at one point to cancel the physical event, um, to be fiscally prudent with our members' money. Um, it costs us somewhere around $200,000 to run the conference. We can't afford to lose $200,000. Um, so we, we cancelled it. What we started thinking was, um, how can we leverage on what we were already thinking about a more distributed model and maybe smaller pieces of conference, and how can we do that um, post-COVID? So we're still thinking about doing something along those lines. We don't have anything um, concrete. Adam's here as well, and he will know that one of the big things that we found hit the, the NDF board is that um, everyone on the NDF board are digital leaders in organisations, and all of our efforts during lockdown was going into maintaining the presence of the museum. We really had zero spare time to be thinking about anything else, so we kind of had to put some stuff on hold. I guess it's also a risk around um, who you have on boards uh, and things like that because if you end up with people who, in senior positions who don't have time to think about other things, um, then there's a risk there as well. So that's some of the stuff that we've been thinking about. It doesn't, COVID hasn't really changed what we were thinking about in the future because we were already heading in this direction, um, but it probably will have a big impact on this year and then hopefully next year we'll, we'll end up in a, um, we'll come out with a new strategy and a more distributed model and a more joined up model with the rest of the sector. Yeah, thank you, Adrian. That's a, that's a really good point that uh, a lot of this work has been in addition to all the other day jobs that everybody has. So um, I, I absolutely take my hats off to the people who have really gone above and beyond to, to uh, not only innovate, but also to share all the, all the learning. Um, so you mentioned that uh, Adam Moriarty from Auckland Museum is, is somewhere on this call and um, is also on the NDF board and has been um, involved in, in some of the more interesting global conversations. Adam, would you like to just tell us very briefly about what matters now? Uh, kia ora, everyone. Um, so I, I kind of, I'm not wearing my, my official NDF or Auckland Museum hat. I just want to talk to you about a project that I, I volunteered for during lockdown. And um, yeah, hopefully, hopefully you'll all join in. Because um, one of the, I guess, one of the frustrating things about the bad lockdown and, and the pandemic is that so many people are doing smart, beautiful, helpful, insightful, and affirming things. Um, but a lot of these things are they're hidden uh, in their own context and communities. Um, 
And so a group of us were sitting down thinking about how we could try and get all these ideas together and so get them to magically appear so that we could share them with everyone globally. Um, and so, yeah, a group of international volunteers got together and we created something called What Matters Now. So it's whatmattersnow.live. Victoria's going to put it in the chat for us. It's already there. Is it? Oh, look at you. I don't even do you do anything. Look at that. It's a delegation. Um, and what, what we're looking for there is uh, five minute talks and performances from people around, around what matters now for you. It's by and for everyone who is creating, making and thinking and caring for each other. Think about all the innovation that's taking place that's happened during COVID-19, as well as the ongoing protests against police violence and racism around the world. And uh, it's a, a volunteer-led uh, effort. Uh, think sort of Ignite or Lightning Talks or short TED Talks. Um, maybe you could facilitate an audience particip uh, participatory activity. Or if you're an artist, you can show or talk about your work. Do some uh, I know, poetry, performance, song, music, dance, theatre, comedy, or just chat about how you're feeling. We're asking to go to that website, upload a uh, five minute talk, it will go onto YouTube. And on the 10th of July, we'll be sort of releasing them all in this event to just sort of capture the, the current feeling of, of the moment. Um, that's, the, that's the elevator pitch. Um, if you have any questions, just uh, grab me on Twitter. Um, I can put, point you to the site, have a look at the FAQ on there. Um, but really, group of volunteers trying to make something happen, and I'm keen to have as many New Zealand voices in there as possible. Uh, kia ora. That's me. Adam. Yeah, this, it's, it's such a cool idea. I just thought it, it's great. It epitomizes to me um, the, the Kiwi ingenuity as well as the digital collaboration that we've all seen, um, which we love about NDF and which is, is just everybody doing what they can to be part of the solution uh, to whatever problems we are currently facing. I don't know if any of our participants have anything else that you'd like to just add before we close this ZOE. Uh, one thing I'll say is um, the way that we're connected, we, can't, we don't have access to chat. So on the jigsaws, um, jigsawexplorer.com. Thank you very much. Jigsawexplorer.com. Here we go. Um, so thank you all very much for sharing your ideas and your thoughts and uh, this is just one of a number of conversations and we will be putting this one up onto YouTube so that some of you might um, be able to review it or share it with others who are not able to join us in person today. And um, Museum Zaotearoa and National Services Te Pairangi will be continuing to facilitate uh, talks about things that matter now. Uh, we may not have them every week all the time, but we'll see how we go. And uh, we hope you've been enjoying it and really appreciate the willingness to share from our colleagues around the country. So kakite anō and thank you very much.